Hey everybody, welcome back to another Creator Spotlight. Today we are joined by Mark Dewidziak, who you can't see, or by the time you're seeing this is probably going to be a still image because we're having a little bit of camera difficulties, but we think it's worth continuing because what he has to say is really more important than, than seeing his face, probably more important than seeing my face too. So, Mark, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if it's too familiar to call you Mark, maybe I should call you Mr. DeWizia. No, 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 no. Mark, Mark. <laughs> no. no, the bones creak enough uh, these days when I'm hearing that. So uh, no, thank you, no, Mark is great. Mm -hmm. Very good, I'm, I'm with you, I've, look at my head, enough gray hair and mm -hmm. less of it, so I, I'm with you. Um, before we get going and just kind of have a conversation about movies and all the things that we love there, uh, go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself. Um, now, I first of all, I was introduced to you through Eric Holmes, so I'm not sure exactly what your relationship or um, what your experience has been with Eric Holmes. He's one of our co-hosts on a Movie Mainline podcast. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, though. Well, um, I'm a writer, uh, primarily. Uh, th that's what I lay claim to, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, everything has always come off the writing. So I, I do act. I do uh, other things. I do teach. I do. But everything comes really because of the writing. Uh, and uh, I was a journalist for 43 years, uh, starting in 1977 and ending uh, in early April of this year. I had a 43 year run in newspapers, mostly as a film and uh, TV critic. Uh, most of those years were spent uh, primarily uh, in that. So some of the books are film and TV related. I, I did a book on the, the Columbo series uh, called The Columbo File, which was just recently uh, reprinted uh, after it was published. The first edition was published in 1989. I did a book on the Night Stalker, uh, and the, and the Carl Kolschak character, and uh, a book on the Twilight Zone. So uh, some of the books are on television. Five of the books are on Mark Twain. You, you're, uh, <laughs> you can't see me right now, but you may put up a picture of me. And I've been playing Mark Twain on stage for 40 years um, yes. with less makeup every year. Uh, Isn't it, that great it, how that works? <laughs> the only thing that age works in your advantage, Bruce, is that it took me two hours to look like Mark Twain when I was 22 it now takes me about five minutes to, to do that makeup. Uh, and and uh, what I did not know when I was 22 and doing the makeup was that I was showing myself exactly what I was going to look like when I was 63, which is uh, pretty much a lot like Mark Twain. And people, I love people who say that you're doing this on purpose. And I said, yes, yes. I went back and had myself genetically uh, re-engineered re so I would look like this when I was 63. Yeah. But uh, so, you know, I, uh, some of the books are on Mark Twain. Some of the books fall on the spooky side of the street. I did a book on Dracula, for instance. Right. Uh, I did a book on uh, um, uh, several, uh, uh, edited three volumes of work by Richard Matheson. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in the, the Night Stalker book, uh, all sort of fall in the Twilight Zone, all kind of fall on the spooky side of the street. And then there's this kind of literary side, too. I did a, a biography of a forgotten American writer named Jim Tully, co-wrote that with a fellow by the name of Paul Bauer, who was a hobo author of the 1920s and 30s, who wrote about the American underclass before Steinbeck, before, nice. wrote about the Irish-American experience before James T. Farrell, uh, before Woody Guthrie. He was sort of the voice of the, uh, of the American underclass. Fascinating guy. But, um, and, and a literary superstar in the, in the 20s, completely forgotten today. So the books are all over the map, you know. I, I, I always cop to the fact that I have a, an extraordinarily schizophrenic resume. Um, I went, I was at a, a book fair a couple of years ago, and they had a, several of the books laid out. And somebody just sort of stopped and looked and <laughs> looked up at me, and then I said, what? And he said, well, I don't get it. I said, well, what's not to get? He said, I don't understand the common theme here. And I said, well, me, me, I'm the common theme. I wrote all these books. That's what's the, you don't need a more common theme than that, but these are all my passions and interests. Yes. Um, and I don't like repeating myself. Uh, the most recent book is, a, is a, a deep dive look at the Shawshank Redemption, for instance. Um, the story, the book, the movie, everything. Uh, uh, I think that I reflects, think doesn't that kind of reflects the human life though, right? I would say uh, most interesting people or people I would find interesting are going to, be able to go in all those different directions. 
You know what I'm saying? Well, it's, it, it's somewhat an American 20th century conceit to have to label something. There's an American right. mania to label something, to pin it down and identify it. And that's why Americans love specialists, we, because we can understand it. We can put it, it's like, it's why Alfred Hitchcock has been lionized as a director over very versatile directors like Howard Hawks and Robert Wise because we almost mistrust versatility and mm. wide interests. And, you know, uh, Hitchcock, well, he directed thrillers. He did d- directed suspense right. thrillers. And that's easy to get your mind around that. Um, and we love our specialists. We love, you know, and so if we could say, well, you know, uh, well, Stephen King, what does he write? Well, he's a horror writer. You know, well, that term didn't even exist in the, in the 19th century. You know, right. if you look at all of the writers who sort of, uh, brought horror into the modern era of the night. The, if you look at uh, people like Mary Shelley and Edgar Allan Poe and Bram Stoker and Robert Louis Stevenson, they would have never called themselves horror writers. They, they wouldn't have known what it meant. Right. First off, they would have said, if they see, if you said, you know, you write, what, what, what do you, Oh, I write Gothic. You, there you mean. But even there, you know, it was just, if it was the best way to tell a story, that's the way you wrote it. You didn't. You didn't stop and say, "I'm, I'm, I'm a horror writer, so therefore I'm going to make sure this story is horror." You said, "Is this the best way to tell a story?" So one day, Robert Louis Stevenson is writing uh, *Treasure Island*. The next day, he's writing *A Child's Garden of Verses*. The next day, he's writing *The Body Snatcher* or *Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde*. He's certainly a landmark horror writer, but he would not have. So I've never kind of bought into that. You know, have I, you, I think that. Have you felt? I mean, I've, I've kind of not gone what I'm going to start with, but I'll, I'll go back to it. Have you felt that being a big part of academia, you know, obviously you've been at uh, Kent state and being a professor teaching, have you felt that you, they at least early on kind of try to pigeonhole you into something, either literature, you know, with big capital well, glowing letters. Let me, let me, um, uh, uh clarify that. Uh, yeah. for a second. Um, I, I'm not an academic. I just play okay. one on television, but uh, in that sphere, I, I, right. I, I, they, I'm an adjunct too. professor, okay. and again, it comes off of writing. I, I started teaching at Kent State as an adjunct professor, teaching a writing course. Uh, and again, so it comes off the writing. And then I created a course on uh, a film studies course on vampires and film and television, where I looked at the metaphoric use of vampires right. through, and how every vampire was shaped by what was happening in the culture at the time, starting with the first one, Nosferatu, who is very much shaped by a pandemic, by the way. Uh, yes. And the Spanish influenza. I just oh. watched your, um, it was like about an hour and a half. Uh, someone had done oh, a YouTube. Oh, the vampire about, talk. <laughs> yeah. So I watched yeah. one of those just to kind of get a feel for that. And and I actually had written down as I was watching it, Pandemic, because that was obviously in 2014, the one I saw. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was, that especially hit me, obviously, because at the time you talked about the pan, only pandemic we've had. In our, and I was like, oh, well, I guess that's been updated. <laughs> so. Yep. Yeah, and and by the way, whatever vampire literature and uh, storytelling comes out of the next ten years is going to be shaped by what we're going through right now. It has yes. to. You can't. You cannot be unaffected by your times. You know, you cannot write a sonnet in your time and not be shaped by what's happening in the culture and the political spectrum and in all the different things that are happening in society. It always comes out metaphorically in the writing. It always comes out. Absolutely. In, in and that's so funny. Anyway, I, you know, but again, I, I'm not, again, I, I'm very clear about this. Um, I, I kind of play professor. Um, Got it. And it's, so it's easy not to be pigeonholed because I go in with my interests and not the other way around, getting shaped by academia and being pigeonholed in any way. Um, I'm just happy they let me in the door and teach my classes every once in a while. It's like with Mark Twain, I, I'm, I'm, uh, a lot of people will refer to me as a Mark Twain scholar, and five of my books are on Twain. But I'm kind of a half-assed Mark Twain scholar. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I, I'm not an academic. I'm not somebody who writes in an academic way. I'm a popular writer. I write, you know, to be read. Um, and I write, as Twain wrote, by the way. Right. Um, so, you know, yeah, and I, and I have given papers at academic conferences, and I have. And I'm just glad they let me in the, into the room to do that. I mean, you know, they let me in through a side door. I can't go in through the front door, but I, they do let me in. And I do my, you know... Uh, my time as like a Mark Twain scholar, but I, you know, I, part of me cringes a little bit when somebody says, you know, you're a professor, you know, and, and right. I think I, I haven't really earned that title um, because I'm, I'm not, I'm a writer. And I, you know, I, when somebody says professor Dewitziak, I, I sort of, I feel a little bit of phony, <laughs> you know, because I, I, 
I, I don't have a PhD. I have my lowly bachelor's degree from George Washington University that I, you know, uh, I set out to be a writer. I said that's, you know, I got out of George Washington and immediately started, you know, making a living by putting nouns and verbs together. And that's what I've done for the, the next 43 years. So um, I, I love teaching. I, I adore it. And I love the students and I love the interaction with the students. And I love to talk about writing. Uh, right. It's one of my favorite and writers. It's one of my favorite things in the world. It, you know, that's one of the common themes in my work is the celebration of writers. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the creative process. I'm sort of fascinated by the writing process. So one of the reasons, you know, I, I wrote about Dracula was because of Bram Stoker. One of the reasons I wrote about the Twilight Zone was because of Rod Serling. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated by uh, writing and the writer process. And I, I don't think if you're a writer, how could you not be? I'm always fascinated by people. If you're a painter, aren't you fascinated by what Rembrandt or Van Gogh did? Uh, w- wouldn't you naturally be uh, fascinated by the creative process? So, you would think, you know, I, but there's a lot of people that don't seem to be very... Um curious yeah. about the world sometimes i have encountered that so um kind of going back to your vampire uh talk that i watched um one of the things i was struck in there and, and first of all right out of the gate just looking at the array of books that you have written and have available still um it definitely checks some boxes in my early experience of things that i had i had encountered but before i mentioned any of those uh in that talk you also talked about really early on how you, you know, were kind of raised watching all of the comedy duos, you know, Laurel and Hardy um, Absolutely. and Abbott and Costello. And it was Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein, I believe you, you mentioned as, as kind of demonst- or, uh, bringing you actually to Dracula character. I believe, I yep. believe he's in that, that one, right? That's right. Yeah. Seven years um, old. And then you talk about running out and going out and buying these two books, uh, Frankenstein and, you know, Dracula and reading Frankenstein first because it looked like the Frankenstein you were expecting. Um, so kind of with that in mind, obviously that was a pretty big impact for you early on. Um, what is a movie pretty early or a book and movie that just really kind of changed the course of your life or just hit you or just impacted you really, really early on? If that isn't it. Well, um, <laughs> you know that's a that's a really good question um and and i would say uh, i would make it a collective answer because you yes. kind of already answered it because it really was collectively the work of primarily three comedy teams it really was collectively the work of abbott and costello laurel and hardy and the three stooges because i grew three up stooges, in, yeah i grew up in new york sure um and uh in the early 1960s uh when you're very first conscious of this sort of thing, um, that's what they gave us as children's entertainment. There, there was sure. no Disney Channel. There was no Nickelodeon. Um, we had the start of things like Hanna-Barbera cartoons, which were uh, made exclusively for uh, the children, not to be seen in a theater by a, mar- by a large audience. And, uh, but the, the first things they gave us as entertainment uh, for, for kids, uh, Saturday afternoons, uh, mm-hmm weekend weekday afternoons was the entertainment of our parents and in some cases our grandparents and they gave us laurel and hardy and uh, it, it was on constantly uh, the, the stooges and that's the headwaters right there's no question you know that that was the headwaters you know i always uh, I, I i did it did lead me to the next big thing which was the horror field and it was mm-hmm. abner because they'll meet frankenstein and i read wpix channel 11 showed it and i was seven years old and I, to this day, I was there for the Abbott and Costello half. I couldn't have cared less about the Frankenstein half of that title. Um, it wasn't until it was over that I had completely fallen under the spell of that type of storytelling. Um, Interesting. And everything went from there. Bruce, if you see, it's not, it became dominoes falling after that. Yes. Because after that, one thing, if you're at all curious, and curiosity is the number one thing I wish I could give people, uh, because... It's it's it, curiosity. It's it's it leads to knowledge. You do there's no knowledge without curiosity. So you have to have right. curiosity first. So curiosity is the most important thing. So if you're at all curious, you know, and and this leads you to uh, the horror field, then you're seeing actors in the horror field. I remember seeing Son of Frankenstein, for instance, 
uh, not too long after all of that. And my father saying, he, Basil Rathbone played Sherlock Holmes, you know. Oh, so now I'm watching Sherlock Holmes movies and that gets me into mystery. And if you're into mystery, that gets you into actors like Humphrey Bogart. Yes. And Sam Spade and the Maltese Falcon. And then somebody said, well, you know, they, they, they were, Bogart started as a gangster. So that gets you into the gangster pictures. And now you're watching Edward G. Robinson and, and Jimmy Cagney. Oh, but Cagney did musicals too. So now <laughs> you're watching right. Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> yeah. And that leads you to singing in the rain. And it's just constant. If, you, it's, it, if you're just, like I said, it becomes dominoes. But there's got to be a start. There's got to be a way in. Yes. And the way in for me was unquestionably comedy teams. Uh, those, those three in particular. And people always say to me, like, the, what about the Marx Brothers? Because, you know, Groucho Marx is one of my favorite comedians of all time. When I was younger, more, many more people, there, there was Mark Twain. I've aged into Mark Twain. But when I was younger, I used to get Groucho much more than I got Twain. And uh, somebody would say something like, well, what about the Marx Brothers? And I said, well, I discovered the Marx Brothers late in life. I was seven years old when I saw the first Marx Brothers. That, that's, yeah, I, I kind of can and, see that too. I was, I'm a little older, but I feel yeah. like, and I don't know if it was something about how cheap it was to get the movies, because I feel like we would see, I would see, and I'm, I'm growing up in the late 60s, early 70s, so not far from you. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing lots of Abbott and Costello and lots of Three Stooges, but not very much Marx Brothers. I had well, a very similar experience. I was, uh, you know, again, and it was seven years old. Again, the seven was a very key age in a lot of ways because it was not only the first horror film, it was also the first Marx Brothers movie. And, you know, it's a joke, but it's not a joke to say I discovered it late in life because I was seven. Yeah. But uh, the, the truth is I had seen a fierce amount of Abbott and Costello and Three Stooges and Laurel and Hardy at that point. And the first Marx Brothers movie wasn't even a very good one. It was Room Service. And that was I don't on, think I've uh, seen Room Service. And Room Service was, it was their attempt to, to adapt a Broadway play to them mm. instead of the other way around. And it's generally considered a failure. Well, it wasn't a failure to me because it was the first Marx Brothers movie. Right. But I could tell... Something was different. I mean, when I watched that room service and thought, this this feels like pure oxygen compared to what I've been watching. There's something. They had that subversive energy. Yeah. That interesting. The, you, yeah. There's some. There's you, a, like you, another you, text going on there, right? And I'd set out to see. I've, I've quickly discovered they, that the Marx Brothers had made 13 movies. Mm -hmm. I set out to see all 13. It took me six years. I was yes. 13 when I saw my last March because you were watching the late show, a library yep. showing, an art house showing of animal crackers or something. And, you know, very, I, uh, it took me six years. You can do that. You can do it in 24 hours. Now you can do it two box sets in 24 hours. Sure. You can see all, all 13 movies. But, you know, back then it took me six years of, it was a treasure hunt. Uh, is, is what it was. And you felt like, oh boy. I, I, yes. I, I Would you, see the big did store. you ever do this? Um, uh, and I'll give you a couple little context pieces to show you why I probably fire off of some of the things that you have as well. So like, for example, TV Guide, you'd get TV Guide. And uh, I remember getting with TV Guide every week and going through it and finding the thing, you know, and for me, it would be like, and this is, this is a little later, but you know, I'd finding like the, you know, the Saturday afternoon, you know, creature feature or the sci-fi creature, or there might be a, you know, owl theater or something like that and trying to find all those things. But really quick to go back, um, why kind of some of the stuff that you talk about, not necessarily yet here, but that you talk about in other places that I've seen, uh, you kind of spark my brain. Uh, my first thing, I think I might have been about five years old. I stayed at um, a neighbor's house being babysat. My mom went and out, did stuff. And the neighbor lady had a, an episode of The Outer Limits came on. Mm. And the infamous opening, you know, we're taking control of the horizontal, we're taking control of the vertical. And my mind was blown. I'm like, what is happening here? And it happened to be the, and I know you've done a thing on the Twilight Zone, but I'm assuming Outer Limits had played a role too for you. Absolutely. Um, it was, I believe, the Xanti Misfits, I want to mm -hmm. say. Yep. And that freaked me out as a little boy. Uh, at about five to maybe six at the oldest. Uh, that one, and then I had a neighbor, I would sneak over to their house to try to watch um, Dark Shadows when it was still airing, airing. And I know you have an interest in Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the storylines were. I didn't know what it was. I knew that I wasn't supposed to watch it. And I knew that it had a vampire. I knew it was scary. And it was on TV like every, almost every day or whatever. I didn't even know the schedule. I just knew it was on and I, I wanted to go see that. And then... 
Um, there was one other thing I was going to bring up, but my brain, of course, is going to going to lose me here. Uh, night gallery. I tried to get a hold of night gallery a little later. So all these kind of things. Um, and of course, Twilight Zone when it came on was was a big deal. So all these things kind of key off in my brain um, and struck me in the same way. Oh, and the big okay, I guess the biggest moment was I must have been six, and somehow I got in front of the original haunting by uh, oh. <laughs> that's Ray, six. Ray Wise. Six. That's a little young to be. Uh... <laughs> and that hit my brain hard. And I, ever since then, I was I was terrified by it because it's a it's a very excellent movie, even by oh, today's yeah. standards. Uh, and recently, it's been rejoined by The Innocents because I went back and watched The Innocents about a year ago and love it as much. But um, that movie really, really struck me and and kind of sparked me on my horror journey so just to kind of give you context not that you need my context but i think you can kind of see that similar it's just that we people who are into this or who have been sparked by the you know sci-fi or horror or whatever it is there's like you said there's like a an inciting incident i guess it would be (laughs) and those are all wonderful influences by the way i mean those are all terrific influences as as a matter of fact there was one because i did not catch up with the haunting until a little bit i was a little older um but there was another movie uh, there was this thing when I was growing up in New York on uh, WOR Channel 9 called The Million Dollar Movie. You know, anybody who's listening and grew up in the New York area is immediately hearing the Gone with the Wind theme in their head because they used Tara's theme as the introduction. And they always showed people coming home from work. And the idea was they would get home from work and they would watch The Million Dollar Movie. The Million Dollar Movie was, in essence, a very cheap piece of programming because WOR was the, uh, the low station in the market at the time. And uh, it was a way of filling a lot of hours very cheaply. They would show the same movie uh, many times, you know, over <laughs> sure. the course of a week. They say, this is the movie of the week. So they would show it every evening. <laughs> and then they would show it maybe, you know, three times on Saturday and twice on Sunday. So, you know, <laughs> now if the million dollar movie happened to be, you know, you know, something you weren't interested in as a kid, you know, it was, it, it was a no brainer. You're just out of there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while, they showed King Kong, and it was a chance mm. to see King Kong 10 times wow, in a matter yes. of days. And so, you know, it was great. Well, they showed a movie uh, when I was still in kind of that formative uh, horror fan age, not long after I'd seen Abbott Costello me Frankenstein. Now, in retrospect, compared to The Haunting, it is not a, uh, uh, a very – it's, it's not a classic from that standpoint. But from, you know, a horror affection, it is. And that was a movie with Vincent Price called House on Haunted Hill. I was going to guess it was a William Castle movie. <laughs> it is a William Castle movie. And that thing got under my skin. Now, you yep. know, you see it today and you think, you, you know, people are like, well, how did that get under your skin? Well, you have to. The thing that hits you when you're youngest is the thing which is like when there's always a debate among vampire fans about who your favorite Dracula is. Well, your favorite Dracula is probably the one that hit you when you were in those formative years. Right. So, I mean, like if you were growing up, if you were a horror fan and you were growing up in the in the fifties and early sixties, you're probably going to say Christopher Lee. That's probably your Dracula because he is mm-hmm. your Dracula. Right. And a very fine choice he is. You know, if you're a little bit older, or maybe then even a little bit younger. Maybe it's Lugosi because you you discovered him on television, or you discovered him actually in the theater. You know, you go a little bit older, maybe somebody's going to say Frank Langella or Gary Oldman or, or Jack Palance or Louis Jordan or somebody. But those early influences are, they're incredibly formative. And they be, remain incredibly resonant throughout your life. There's no replacing them. And you can't sort of introduce somebody else to them. Like if somebody is 40 years old and you say, sit down and watch this movie. This thing terrified me when I was in there. They're yes. going to sit there and go, what, what, what is, what are you talking about? This is a, what a cheesy movie. This is you know? because they can't go back and recapture that moment. Yeah, right. Of seeing it through the eyes of a nine year old, seeing it for the first time. So those influences are, you, you hope you get really, really good influences at that age. You, you were, you were, you were exposed to something that's really potent and it's so potent that it will put your head on a swivel. And mm-hmm. when I say on a swivel, it's back to this curiosity thing. In other words, that now you are looking forward at what's the next thing that's going to come out. What's going to, what's it going to lead to? I'm very excited about this. 
um, looking at the culture of today, that's great, but it also lets you look at where it all came from and lets you look at the past. Um, and if you really have curiosity and if you were really a, you know, a, it's one of the things I love about uh, horror fans is that um, horror fans tend to have more of a, uh, an appreciation of the history of the genre True. than most other genres. And I'm not going to say all other genres, but there's a lot of people who will say, well, I'm into musicals. I really love musicals, you know? And then when you come down to it, what they really mean is they love that's everything that's kind of lay Miz or phantom after. Right. No, I didn't say, well, guys and dolls, you know, they have no idea what you're talking about. You know, my fair lady, (laughs) they have no idea what you're talking about. And and, and, and to get to the headwaters of of people like Jerome Kern uh, and Irving Berlin, uh, you know, and the, and and the Gershwins, it's, 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 it's almost like it doesn't exist. It's part of a history that doesn't exist. Um, So one of the reasons, you know, I think horror fans, um, they, and they're very willing to give it a chance too, because if you say to them, well, you know, have you ever seen the 1956 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Right. No. You know, check it out. Check out. They come back. It's like, ah, it's great. You know, is there anything more, anything else like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot more to recommend to you now. Um, I think that that's, there, there's more of a door that opens up. Nosferatu, you know, I mean, Nosferatu remains a very eerie, creepy movie right. uh, on so many levels. And um, I would show it in my class, in my vampire class. Now, to half my students, Nosferatu is everything they hate and despise. And n- nothing's going to bring them around. It's, it's right. old, it's foreign, it's black and white, it's got subtitles, it's ancient. <laughs> yeah, right. you know, it just goes on and on. But to the half of the class, it's, it's, it's really a, a transformative experience. They've never seen anything like it before. And it's like, that's really neat. That was really in- incredible. It, you yeah. know, and, and, and it does have this kind of eerie quality because it is so old. And then they might um, go see Caligari and they might go see M and they might go if, see if, Faust and they might exactly. start going down the, the pathway of, Hey, wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff, especially if you get some of the pre-code stuff. If it uh, leads you to Long Cheney, yeah. maybe Cheney's going to lead you to the, the, the next generation uh, of, of, of horror stars. And that's going to get you to Karloff and Lugosi, which will get you to Cheney Jr. Which will get, again, it just, it's rolling thunder. If you, yes. and it's kind of easier to have the rolling thunder in the horror field than it is in some other places. Um, I like that about, you know, the, uh, about the, the fans of the spooky and the, they, they, they even know the, the, you know, there's an appreciation of the literature, mm-hmm. you know, there's an appreciation of, and one reason is because there are so few real masters. Horror is one of the, John D. McDonald, the mystery writer, mm-hmm. um, he, he, great quote, great quote. He, he wrote this in an introduction to Stephen King's first volume of, of short stories, Night Shift. Night Shift, yep. And uh, he, had, he had said in that introduction that the two hardest forms to write are the two forms that get the least amount of respect. But among writers, it is, it is a given that the two hardest forms to master are humor and horror. And in McDonald's words, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that the in the wrong hands, the horror becomes humorous and the humor becomes horrible. <laughs> that's and great. That, that's that's somewhat true. And so yep. there's so few. We're still reading. I mean, you know, if you you come of age in horror, you know, there's a tendency to go back and read Lovecraft and, mm-hmm. and Poe and 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 Stoker and those guys to say, you know, where did this come from? Where you know, where, yeah. where are we? So I mean, I've I like always. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you there. I, I've always been more of a of a movie fan, but I did that same path. I you know I went went you know got the complete works of Poe, read Lovecraft, went back and read a lot of that. I read you know Dracula, and then it's interesting you'd mentioned because uh, Stephen King, because of course I was right in the wheelhouse. I mean I'm you know twenty years old, you know eight teens to twenties when he's just hitting his stride. So I'm reading some of his stuff, and but I remember when he came out with his first. His nonfiction book, what's it I want to call Dance Dance Macabre. Macabre. Dance Macabre. And that kind of did the reverse because then I went back and found a bunch of movies based on Dance Macabre. I remember he mm-hmm. mentions all these things I'd never heard of before. You know, he mentions Dementia 13. He mentioned um uh he mentioned Night Gallery episode that I'd never seen about the um the the earwig. Yes. You know? <laughs> so and he goes through a whole bunch of stuff and he talks, he kind of talks about the philosophy of, of, you know, horror uh, as a writer, but also in the visual movie sense. And I think that it's kind of the reverse osmosis there, you know, or you've got the, the, you know, the movie leading you to the author, then the author leading you back to the movies. So that's kind of fun and interesting as well. Um, yeah. 
It's true. You know, uh, the, the, you know the, 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 the last book, the Shawshank book, actually mm -hmm. came out what well, was going to be a much bigger book on Stephen King. The, the plan was actually to write a book um, which would look at all of the uh, adaptations of King's work into other realms. And uh, it was it was kind of too big a book. After I was going to say, that's you pretty can, daunting. <laughs> well, you, you can plan a book that's too heavy to p pick up after a while. That, right. That's entirely possible. <laughs> and I'd been researching and, and interviewing. Uh, for and, and you know, remember, a lot of this fell into my wheelhouse as a film and TV critic over the years. Right. So over the years, I've had a chance to interview uh, dozens upon dozens of people who have uh, been involved with uh, King adaptations and King himself. And uh, it, you kind of feel like, well, I've got all this material, you know, it'd be, uh, you've got to use it. So, you know, after the Twilight Zone book, I was, my agent was actually shopping this book around. And it was then that we kind of realized that the 25th anniversary of, the, of Shawshank was coming up. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I was there. Uh, I was a film critic at the Akron, Ohio newspaper at the time. And uh, I covered the making of the film in 93 in, in Mansfield, Ohio shot at 99% was shot in, in the middle, in middle Ohio. And, uh, they, so, you know, I said, why don't we draw that chapter out and just do a real deep dive on Shawshank. And, uh, I ran the, that idea by Stephen King who loved it, the idea, the idea. And then I ended up doing about 75 interviews for that from everybody from Stephen King down to the woman who trained the rats for the prison scenes. Nice. And, um, you know, and, and I realized that kind of that was going to be my Stephen King book um, when, when I this was the it wasn't going to be this huge mammoth work about, you know, all of these movies. It was going to be a very concentrated look at this one movie that has become such a beloved movie and such a beloved film. Um, you know, uh, we're having this conversation talking about movies that we came of age in. Think of the number of people who are going to have this conversation 50 years from now that it's going to be Shawshank. That's going to be one of oh, those yes. movies that people are going to be talking about. Well, so, and he's one of the few authors. I mean, once again, you talk about, um, you know, kind of the way uh, a horror can kind of tap into things. One of the few authors that has had that effect on how many generations now? Yeah. You know, you know he's a, you know, he's an underrated a writer. I mean, it's a point that I make in the book, which is um, actually I didn't make it. The person who made it, I was more than willing to carry it along. But actually, of all people, Anne Rice said this. Mm. You know, looking across the aisle at, a, at another best-selling horror writer, Anne Rice said, you know, that Stephen King is going to be the Charles Dickens of our time. Right. And she said, you know, he's the only writer who's really talking about what life is like down at the 7-Eleven, what life is like at the local supermarket, what life is like at that level of you know the average american uh, out there and nobody else is writing about that nobody else is really tapping into that he's doing it metaphorically obviously through the horror story but th if you want to know what life was like on the streets of london in the 1840s you're not going to go to the writers who were you know like like uh, thackeray and carlisle you're going to have to go to dickens if you want to know what th what that was about and yes. he was considered the popular writer at the time and it took a long time for academia to come around to Dickens worth as a writer. And I think it's going to take a long time too. I think, but I think a uh, hundred years from now, people are going to look back and they're going to be studying Stephen King's work. And I know there's people up there laughing up their sleeves right now. He's even suggesting this and saying this, but I think King's stature as an American writer, an important American writer is going to grow. Well, that kind of speaks to how you, kind of characterize yourself in the academic community though, right? Because you're kind of in a similar boat, right? You kind of come from the other angle into that sphere, not really being a full part of that sphere from the way you describe yourself. He's in a similar boat. I mean, he talks about that thing in Dance Macabre, how he you know, took the classes and they said he'd never make it and all this kind of stuff. And then he goes on and says, well, I just want to write. I want to write. And he just leaves. And I think he starts publishing in like Playboy and all these different like, you know, Pulpy Cavalier. magazines, yeah, <laughs> pulpy magazines, just to get stories out there, and he's writing under pseudonyms and doing all kinds of stuff. But the further, bigger point I want to get out with that, I think, is that I've had, I've started doing these conversations in earnest in the last few months, partly as just, um, just a way to celebrate, you know, people who are creating in some way or another, because 
in a divisive world and where everything's you know separating things, I want to talk about people who are actually making things. Uh, but furthermore, almost every one of these discussions has come into somehow, um, especially around horror, but it could be any film. Um, but especially horror and sci-fi to some degree, I feel like a lot of times, kind of like you're talking about with King, they tap into something in the moment in a way sometimes that's more vital, uh, more subversive, uh, more biting um, of their time. And it isn't recognized a lot of times until later if it's recognized at all for what it is. Um, I don't know if you, I, I think you probably do agree with that because we talk, you talk about a lot in the, the vampire stuff about how it's really a mirror of its time. It always is, always is, and and you know, it, you could this could dovetail into the Twilight Zone very easily because the Twilight Zone was Rod Serling created the Twilight Zone as a way of getting the message across when it was getting increasingly difficult to talk about, yes. uh, you know, what he wanted to discuss, the serious things he wanted to discuss in television. So he decided that he would metaphorically tell it yes. and hide the message. And uh, you got Twilight Zone and Star Trek that, doing that, right? Yeah. Well, Twilight Rod Zone and Star Barry, Trek. Roddenberry went to school on Serling and he said it. He said that, you know, Rod showed him how you do it. That if you put it on a spaceship and send it to Alpha Centauri, you can talk about war, prejudice, bigotry. You can talk about whatever you want and the censors aren't going to even lift an eyebrow about it. And Rod, he, I mean, he took the gamble on that. He, if you haven't seen it, there's this wonderful uh, interview he did with Mike Wallace um, before the Twilight Zone. Rod uh, Serling? Yeah. And I might have seen a clip of it that new that recent Mike Wallace movie documentary, yeah, but I don't think I've seen the actual one. Clip and it's on YouTube. It's easily found, but but yeah. it's the two of them. And you know, Mike Wallace is pre sixty minutes, but it's still you know snarky Mike Wallace. You know? Oh yeah, and he's got they're both smoking away like stacks. And, oh sure, you know, and and Wallace says to him at one point, "Well, well, Rod, you're you're doing this thing called the Twilight Zone. I I I I, I guess we can assume you're done with serious writing right now." <laughs> And the camera zooms in on, and Rod's got this look on his face like, sure. you know, the cat that just ate the canary. Because oh, yeah, I'm done. Mm -hmm. he, he and the magician can't give away his trick. So he basically looks at Mike Wallace and says, you're right, Mike, I'm, I'm done with serious writing for a while. And now he does the most important thing that he's going to do. And he understands that I want to talk about these things. I want to talk about how we treat the elderly. I want to how we treat children. Bigotry prejudice. Yep. I want to talk about all this stuff, nuclear war, uh, all of this stuff I want to get into. And I'm going to be able to do it all. Well, but I'm going to put it in the guise of fantasy. And it's and why that Zone stuff is still most, so vital. Like a lot right? of those are still totally watchable. I watched some Twilight Zone episodes with my kids and my kid, um, my, he's now 11. Um, and we, I try to do kind of the thing we talked about, show them things that I liked, uh, but some other things too. Uh, and I said, let's just watch some Twilight Zones. And it worked. It, 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 it and and in fact, some Twilight Zones are more relevant now than when they first aired. You know, a very good example is the monsters are doing Maple Street. Yes. In that mm -hmm. episode, as we to, getting to what you're talking about, as we become more divided as a society and a culture, and Rod's basic now, Rod is definitely writing about uh, the McCarthy era. He's to, he's sure. definitely writing metaphorically about the Red Scare, and people turning on neighbors and friends turning on friends. Uh, but you see it now. And it seems like he's talking about America today much more than he's mm -hmm. talking about America. That, that episode aired in 1959. Yep. And, you know, the lesson of that episode is divided we fall. If we do not find a way to talk to each other, if we do not find a way to communicate with each other and understand each other, we are not going to make it. It's just as plain as that. Lincoln is right. You know, Lincoln was, was absolutely correct, as he was about a lot of things. We divided, we, we, we are going to fall. So uh, the Twilight Zone is probably the most referenced television show today. You know, mm -hmm. like, you know more than 60 years after its premiere, it is, and in a black and white show, it is, it is the most referenced TV show by far. And there's a reason for that, because that storytelling is timeless. And it is not... You know, and Rod was right. The, the Twilight Zone is as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. Turns out he was right. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's a very good example of that. That, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, fantasy storytelling, supernatural storytelling, horror, whatever you want to label it. Um, it, is it is usually the stuff which is not only very the most 
commenting on its times, but then becomes very malleable later on. It's like Dracula. Dracula, you know, right. is endlessly reinterpreted as, as a metaphor. We bend Dracula to suit our time, to make it, uh, to make it suit our, to our time. And I think that's, that's what, it speaks to the metaphoric power of that kind of storytelling. Or even to a lesser degree, things like, you know, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, like you mentioned earlier, how it transforms or how um, uh, the thing transforms, you know, over time. And, you know, either thing. Right? Actually, you know, yeah. the, that, that's one of the few things where you've got two versions, which are, yep. you know, both stand out really well. Well, that's why I think those those two examples are really comparable because you've got the kind of the fifties paranoia version, and then you've got the seventies, uh, early eighties versions of both those stories too. And just how they, uh, how they really do a different reflection of their particular times. Like that's right. That's very, right. And, and, and they're and, both, and they're all good. Yeah. Oh, all yeah. really good. Oh yeah. I mean, like I said, it's, you know, you, it, it's, it's, and you can do that with, with, with horror almost more than other things because other things tend to get a little bit more trapped mm -hmm. instead of benefiting from their, their, their era. They almost get trapped by their era, you know? So you, you, you become, because those things, but it, with horror, it's, it's like I said, there's almost this mystical quality around it that, just, 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 and it's just, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's, well, it's why Dracula could speak to me at seven years old and then speak to me in a totally different voice at 14. It's the reason it also can, it's almost always has a metaphoric level if, if it's done well too, where, and it, so it, it almost always can operate on at least two levels. Whereas a really good drama is often going to be a really good drama and it is what it is. It might have some other metaphoric levels, but you get a really, interesting concept horror movie it's like okay this is thrilling it's scary makes me grab onto the person next to me or makes me hide behind my blankets but it also does name your metaphor whatever it's it's else is doing plus like you said it can transform or it's another thing that's come up in several of these conversations i'm kind of curious about your take on this um talking about the mirror of the time aspect that a lot of these movies have um a lot of times i feel like you can't quite catch it during the time either like it doesn't always make itself clear in other words sometimes you're not quite sure what it's tapping into until some time has passed um, i think that's true of everything in life bruce i think that's true, true. Of, of us as individuals <laughs> is is you know um well when something when you when you're first faced with something mm -hmm. whatever it is in life whether it's a problem a crisis um or, or something, you know, as common as a movie, you tend to be right up against it. Your, your, your nose is right up against the, the wall. And that perspective means you don't, can't see very much left, right, up, down. It's like, you know, I don't know people who get trapped in life. And I say, like, you know, I can't get around this wall. I say, well, why can't you get around it? Well, look at it. It's a brick wall. It's, 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 it's. Five feet thick. I can't go through the wall, and I can't go over the wall because it's 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 thirty feet high, <laughs> so I can't get over it. And I say, step back for a second. Look, the wall is only three feet wide, though. You can go around it. You can go around. It. Now that takes perspective. What it means is you have to step back in order right. to be able to see the wall properly. And I think that's true of movies and stories as well time adds a little bit of perspective to it and you step True. back and you go aha do did most of the people who watch nosferatu know that the spanish influenza epidemic uh had influenced that film probably not you know it probably took a lot of time uh for that to sort of become obvious it generally takes a little bit of looking back to understand certainly with those 1950s movies where so much of it was informed by the time, I mean, some of it's obvious. I mean, if you watch right. you know, Godzilla now and you have a, you know, Tokyo <laughs> being devastated by a, <laughs> a radioactive uh, a, a monster, radioactive, right? it's, yeah. it's a little obvious. It's no, no less good. No less good. You no, know, it's awesome. A tremendous Godzilla fan here, but you know, um, but some of it, yeah, I think it did take time to sort of say, Hey, um, there, that was a, a red scare, uh, metaphor operating there, or that was a McCarthyism moment there. Um, yeah, and I think that's true. And I, but I think that's true as individuals. It's it's true as in life, and it's true in your career. I, I use this, you know, I told this to somebody just the other day, which is, you know, 
my first book was published in 19... 19- I, I we talk about your bones creaking. I'm going to say this out loud, <laughs> and people are going to say, "Did he write that with a papyrus and a quill pen?" <laughs> but my first book was published in 1982. Sure. Okay. Um, and it was a it was a piece of theater history, of all things. And I knew what my second book was going to be. If you had asked me, "Is that book was getting ready to be published?" and you said, "Mark, which, what what are you going to write next?" And I said, "I'm going to write the history of the Twilight Zone. That's what I'm going to write." I was living and working in East Tennessee at the time. And nothing in my brain said, maybe East Tennessee is not the best place to research a book on the Twilight Zone. (laughs) You know, I was in my mid-20s. You know, I I was, uh, why not me? It's my favorite show of all time. It is the most influential TV show on me and, and on so many other people. Why not me? And I actually had done some interviews to fool myself into thinking I was going to write that book. Uh, Donna Douglas from the Beverly Hillbillies had come Mm. to town to shoot a commercial. So I ran down to the shooting site because I knew she'd been an eye of the beholder on the Twilight Zone. And I I interviewed Donna Douglas about her experiences. Two of the people who had been at the theater I'd been researching had gotten their start at that theater. uh, Fritz Weaver and Claude Akins, both in Twilight Zone. Fritz Weaver and Claude Akins, yes. Yes. um, Both in great Twilight Zone. I am old enough to know the names very well. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to write this book. And then, you know, I had the experience that a lot of authors have and will have throughout their lives. I walked into a bookstore and there it was. Mark Scott Secree's The Twilight Zone Companion, published mm. in 1983. <laughs> and I couldn't even, no, I couldn't even be mad about it, Bruce. I, I, I couldn't allow myself to be, because Mark done a great job, far better than I would ever have done with it. It was a, it was a great book. Um, and I immediately set my sights on another favorite TV show, Columbo. Right. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to write the book on Columbo. And then I got the job at the Akron Beacon Journal. And all of a sudden, I was in a great position to write a book about a TV show because my job dovetailed into that. And it took me five years to research it and write it, but that book was published in 1989. And my whole goal was to write as good a book on Columbo as Mark had done on The Twilight Zone. It was the bar that I, that I, that I had set out to reach. And at that point, if you had said to me, well, what's your next book going to be? I just said, well, I know what my next book is going to be because I have a handshake deal with my publisher. It's going to be on Dashiell Hammett. I know it's going to be on Hammett. Maltese Falcon is one of my favorite movies. I know it's going to be this because we, we've agreed to it. And at that point, Warner Books had bought the Mysterious Press and stepped in and said, no more nonfiction books. You're strictly a fiction press. And the deal, which was completely sewn up, the stitchings came loose. And I was like, well, now what am I going to write next? And it is this point that fate, the universe, whatever you want to call it, whatever steps in at the moment you think you're in charge and you think you're calling the shots, something else steps in. And a publisher called me, a small publisher said, I love your Columbo book. I said, well, that makes two of us. And he said, well, have you ever thought about doing the same type of book on The Night Stalker? Nice. And so, I, said, I, I said, I love that show. I said, you, I just didn't know there was a publisher crazy enough to do a book on the night so he said well i'm crazy enough to do it that was gonna be my question to you because so i i saw the night stalker in the wild uh i was you know you kind of get a picture like i was probably looking finding that kind of thing too and you are going to be able to tell me the answer to this because i haven't read your books yet um do i remember it airing pretty late on an odd times or am i imagining that you're imagining that okay. uh, I, I, well you're probably imagining the reruns on the cbs late night uh, schedule. Maybe okay. that's where I discovered it because I know I saw it when it came a out. A lot of people discovered it. This, the, 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 uh, four, uh, 16 of the episodes, they had pulled out four because they had made two movies hacked together from the Right, episode. the two movies, yeah. yeah. Universal uh, had uh, the, the 16 episodes on the CBS late night schedule for a long time. And mm-hmm. that was where a lot of people discovered it. The original movie, The Night Stalker, Mm-hmm. aired on a Tuesday night and it was a 90 minute time slot and uh it, and it and it didn't, wasn't late or anything like that that's when they were doing all the, like the Sunday night movies and they were doing a lot of those like TV right. movie stuff that's right yep. mm-hmm. uh, ABC had gotten into the TV movie business right so um and they had their own uh unit called ABC Circle Films so most of the movies were actually uh, not only uh, aired on ABC they were made by ABC 
So um, it was a good profit center for them for a long time. And that's where the Night Stalker came out of that in January of 1972. So we're, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the original movie. But that was fate stepping in. That was basically, mm -hmm. I thought, after the Columbo book, well, you know, it's been decided. I'm the mystery guy. I'm going to, you know, I did Columbo, and now I'm going to do Dashiell Hammett. And fate sort of stepped in and wagged its finger at me and said, no, no, no. You're a monster kid. <laughs> you, you know, Columbo was, 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 it's good you got Columbo, but Columbo's the path to get back on track here because you wrote, you grew up as, a, as, as, we didn't have that term in the 60s. We have it now. We call, you know, say you, that you're a monster kid. What another way of saying a horror fan. Sure. But we, we didn't have that. But if you got famous monsters of Filmland magazine and were watching Dark Shadows and Hammer Horror films, you were a monster kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was. So I um, this was fate putting me back. And that led to writing the first Kolshak novel that had been published in 20 years at that point, Grave Secrets, which was published in 94. That led to the revised edition of Night Stalking, the Night Stalker Companion in 97. That led to editing three volumes of Richard Matheson's work and becoming a, a, a good and dear friend with Richard that led to the Dracula book. And then it that just all, all kind the of went from there. I need. And then you got back to, right. Twilight you got, you see, you just, <laughs> you just put it on. That's the button on it right there it is it was a big circle back to the twilight zone. Wasn't it now? So I gotta if say I'm to sitting you, I... there with my nose up against that brick wall, do I see that pattern? As it's happening step by step, no. Did I think I was in charge? Of course I was in charge. I was making the decisions. Now I step back and I look at it and say, this was all about getting me back to the twilight zone. And the real avenue to that was sharing it with my daughter. When my daughter turned uh, 15, she had seen all of the night galleries. She loved night gallery. Mm -hmm. And she'd seen a lot of that kind of stuff. And I said, well, all right, it's time for your PhD in this stuff. Let's watch the twilight zone. So we did a forced march through all 156 episodes starting in order. Nice. And it became a running joke with us where after we'd watch the episode, I turned to her and shake my finger at her and say, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> and it became, it was a joke, you know, and, and, you know, I can run a joke into the ground with the best of them. But after four or five weeks of this, the penny finally dropped. And I said, you idiot, this is your Twilight Zone book. Extracting the life lessons and the parables and the metaphors out of the twilight zone Perfect. and pouring the, this book. This is the twilight. You, you weren't meant to write that twilight zone book back in the early 1980s. This is your. Because one. you didn't have the life behind you at that point. So no, no. Um, so that, so that, that's, that's sort of an example of not only the timelessness of it, but it's also an example of how, uh, you know, fate does step in and take a, take a hand in these things when, you know, you think you're in charge and, uh, and you're not, you, 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 <laughs> I've never been right about my next book. Let me put it that way. I've always said, you know, this is gonna, my, my plans have never worked out, but they, but things have always worked out splendidly well, you know? So just so you know, if I were to go like about six feet over there, which you can, they can see me, I guess you can't, can't see you about six feet over there. I could open that closet and take out a box and there are famous monster film land books, magazines in there still. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can remember very, the, very clearly the very first famous monsters of film lands that I bought, and it had Peter Cushing on the cover. Um, he had the uh, Squirm was one of the movies that it featured in there. If you know the movie Squirm, sure. <laughs> and it had I think Roman Polanski's uh, um, uh, Fearless Vampire Killers in there, and a bunch of other weird stuff. And then of course I went on into Fangoria and. Off it, off it went in the eighties. You may have been, you may have been beyond that at that point to be getting those kind of magazines. But well, actually, I wrote for him. Uh, Angoria? No, Cine Fantastique. Oh, Cine Fantastique. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I was, I was one of the uh, the stable of writers in the late eighties, and the only reason, the the, the the only reason I, I I greatly enjoyed writing for them. But um, one of the reasons I wrote for Cinefan was I thought it was kind of the closest thing to writing for Famous Monsters or Castle of Frankenstein from my youth, you know, and I, I wanted to write it. And I was an established TV critic at that point. So um, uh, I started writing. I wrote for them for about three years. I was, you know, I did a, uh, several cover stories. As a matter of fact, I did the cover story on Dark Shadows for them uh, when they did the revival in, in 91 of Dark Shadows. I did uh, a package of stories looking at the original series and then the what was the uh, the 13 episode reboot on NBC. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
yeah, that was again, and it's about following your passions and pursuing the things that you know that, that fired you up when you were a kid. Um, you know, my first, uh, I think '65 was my first uh, issue of Famous Monsters. It had sort of the bluish uh, picture of Lugosi on the cover. Right. Uh, yeah, and that was, people that underestimate was, Famous Monsters of Filmland being probably. I mean, if you think about it, as far as I mean, comic books influenced a whole generation of people in a certain direction the famous monsters of Filmland. i i don't i, I don't know horror fans underestimate it because True. you know, you know it, it it was as close to, in, a, in a in a world that did not know an internet or a facebook or or chat rooms or anything like that um famous monsters was pretty much the house organ for uh for horror fandom well i think of it as the beginning of a fandom well, it, it jumped on it. The yeah. real beginning, uh, to me, the real beginning is is 1957. Is is Universal's release of the their 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 library of shock theater, uh, okay. shock, you know, and which led to the sort of the the, the phenomena of the horror host. But right. the release of those movies, and I think before 57, people didn't really much identify themselves as horror fans. Um, you might like horror movies or monster movies or whatever they call them before that, but 57, you have this, there's release and all of a sudden this new generation, uh, uh, people are going to go on and become the great directors and writers, uh, you know, are all of a sudden going to school on shock. And, uh, you know, James Warren and Farce Ackerman at that point recognized what was happening and said, aha, <laughs> yeah. there, there is an audience for this. And they created a magazine in response. So it's kind of a one-two punch. Right. Uh, okay. I see that. I, I, think it, I think it actually starts with the, with the, with shock. And then, you know, it sort of builds from there. And then, you know, very quickly after that, they, they start famous monsters. And I feel like that's also one of the first things, and I could be wrong about this too, but um, famous monsters or things like that are the, the first places where you start getting discussions of like actually knowing the names and and idolizing the technical people like the ray harryhausens sure. and yeah. the people that are making the animatronics and then making the mask makers and the uh you know dick smith a little later on doing you know all his special yeah. effects yeah and even the 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 the, the guys that like like chain like lon cheney senior yeah and, right and, and jack pierce and uh ben nye and i was you'd learn the names of all these makeup artists and special effects guys and Willis O'Brien and you learned all these, 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 these names uh, because you know, the people who did the magazine cherish those, those people. So you cherish them and, and learned who they were. So all of these things that you, you know, kind of have dived deep into and you've written books about, you've discussed cultural relevance, all these different things you've done. Has there been, I mean, you've talked about Shawshank that's you know relatively recent. Um, has there been anything in the last 10, 15 years that's really, or a few things that have really um, caught your eye or, or your passion? Oh, you mean culturally? Culturally or in film or in horror or in... Like, oh, pick? all of it, all the time. I, yeah. we'll, be, we'll be here forever if we go, we go down there. <laughs> well, pick a few. You know, How's that? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, on, you know, on the tel first off, I think a lot of the, um, the more in intelligent... Um, and 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 I don't know how it was substantial okay. storytelling horror has gone to the TV side, you know, because mm -hmm. um, uh, movies more and more were just taken. First off, I mean, movies demographically have been positioned more and more for younger audiences. Oh. Um, so I mean, and, and so the reflection of those movies have got to change. So you know, we we sort of morphed from the slasher film to the torture porn movies. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the growth and there's always been a place for that uh, there's always been a you know i mean fangoria made its it, there wouldn't have been a fangoria without the, the slasher films of, without the of, gore in there right yeah <laughs> um you know and and i mean it's it's one it's the it's the, the stephen king you know three-tiered of horror you know that uh terror works on the brain and is the highest form horror works on the heart and is the second form and then below that is the gross out which works on the stomach level stomach right level. And, you know, as King famously said, I always go for your brain. If I can't get your brain, I'll get your heart. If I don't get your heart, I ain't proud. I'll go for the gross out. Um, and I think, you know, there's always a place for that. But sort of the, the more cerebral uh, storytelling went to television. And some of the, the best 
from the nineties on, you know, starting with Buffy, I think Buffy and mm-hmm. X-Files are, you know, uh, and they come out of the traditions of, of, of the twilight zone and night stalker and that stuff. And now uh, black mirror, if you probably watch some of now, black mirror. yeah, now black mirror and, and, uh, you know, on the comic side, what we do in the shadows is a, I'm, I'm yes. a big fan of what we do in the shadows. I, I am too. It's hilarious. Uh, I think it's one of the best comedies and best horror things on TV. All yes. at the same time. Um, and then in the last, you know, several years, I, Penny Dreadful, I was very uh, enamored of Penny Dreadful. I was very upset when they sort of just stopped it. And I was one of those people who kind of stood up and said, hey, get back in here and finish this story. <laughs> <laughs> That's always uh, aggravating when you have something that just yeah. ends. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, uh, th- there's been some exceptional, uh, you know, bits and pieces of American Horror Story. Uh, Mm-hmm. Walking Dead in its early years, mm-hmm. uh, nothing better. I mean, it was it was great. Uh, it it kind of went off the rails. It did, yeah. Uh, but but it it when it was at its peak, people I think now people are, are are thinking of the Walking Dead by what it's become, and are forgetting what it was. Um, the first three seasons of True Blood. Uh, yeah, you, I'm with you on some, that too. You've got some exceptional stuff done. You know, like I said on the horror side, where I think some of your 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 best writers in this realm. Uh, are working on that side of the, sh- are working on the, the more on the, which is not to say because obviously you have Guillermo del Toro and people like that making movies who are, you know, who are really passionate about this and really knowledgeable. I mean, you want to talk about mm-hmm. somebody, he, he, he didn't slept this stuff. You know, you talk about a monster kid, del Toro is. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's major. <laughs> well, I love it when you find a director that you like and then you see that, that when you find out that they're a huge fan too. That can become really interesting to watch that their fandom uh, uh, combined with their creativity. Um, right. oh, and yeah. I would agree as far as the movie side, I think right now or in the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of it's in more independent or even um, international horror. There's some really interesting stuff going on. But right. it's not um, going to happen in the mainstream. Yeah, that's no. exactly right. That's exactly Very right. little is going on in the mainstream. Or if it gets released, it's going to get released um, kind of mainstream, but it's going to be something like A24 is going to put it out. Something that's still basically art house and be able, able to be curated, not going to be produced by, you know, pick your big studio. Um, that, that, that's a constant too. Some of the most interesting stuff in horror has always sort of come from those, you know, mm-hmm. odd directions like South America or, uh, yeah. you know, or, or some of those European independent movies over the years. You know, you've always had some very interesting people working in those realms. Oh yeah. You get it takes eyes a while. without a face or you get, you know, the things you're getting out there that. Yeah. Well, because they'll take the chances and they will also do things based more on, uh, what they don't have sometimes and rather what they have. So, you know, they become yes. a little bit more inventive <laughs> in, in what they're doing. They, they rely more on atmosphere and, uh, and, and, and storytelling. And it's, it's, it just becomes a, a, a more true to the form, I think. And you know what I think has become really interesting over the last five or six, 10 years is some of the most interesting horror being made right now are being made by um, women directors. And I think that women directors who are actually, way more prolific in that sort of subgenre or versions of that are finding that they have this kind of this freedom to really, like we talked about before, explore these really tough ideas or really interesting aspects of them. And they can, they can hide it in horror and they can I, get. I, I think that's true. And, and even on the mainstream side of that, I think you could say that that's true. Like with somebody like Jordan Peele, who, yes, you know, absolutely. basically say, you know, because, as much as we admire and cherish, and this is not certainly denigrating anybody and, you know, but, and not trying to make this political anyway, but it's just the damn truth. Oh yeah. For, for, for many decades and for a long time, the finger on the trigger of horror was male Mm -hmm. and white and middle-aged. And, you know, it was, it came from a very, uh, singular vision yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly so when you get horror being made by anybody who does not sort of fit that profile we'll, we'll always have that it's not like we're going to lose that it's not like all of a yeah. sudden we won't have the stephen king perspective or somebody like that um but you gain so much when all of a sudden you are getting this the this from different and it's like you say it not only seems uh, it, it, it seems fresh. It seems like yep. it, because you haven't been getting that perspective before and they're going to use it metaphorically in ways that, you know, the, the, the more traditional avenues didn't think about. Well, so, and you know, it's always good to open it yes. up. Yes. I mean, and, just in the last, 
what, two weeks, I've seen um, three good to pretty, pretty great movies. And one is a woman director from Australia. Another is an Indonesian director. And the other one is a woman director from Europe. And cool, awesome. Bring yeah, it and, on. And it's not just, you know, the fact that they're women, but there was a women coming from three different cultures. Yes. So you're getting voices three different and backgrounds. Yes. From, you know, that, that what they're going to do with this is going to be so completely different yep. that it's, 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 it can only have a good effect yep. uh, down the road because, you know, we don't need, you know, and this is not denigrating anybody's taste in, in our, you know, we don't need hostile 15, you know, <sighs> We, we, we don't. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't do Eli Roth. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't. And again, I'm not, I'm not even saying there isn't a place for, you know, there's always a place. It's a, it's a very big house is what I'm saying. Yeah. And oh it yeah. It does not have to be reduced to the, it's, it's sort of like, you know, something that, that's happened with comedy too, is like after a while, you know, I got uh, the comedy that I grew up with was always, was, was in many ways more diverse Mm, mm -hmm. then you know because a lot of it came out of vaudeville and vaudeville reflected a lot of different sensibilities right you know so you know on any given variety show of the 1960s maybe you got you know uh red fox maybe i was gonna you say got, and you have uh, black uh, american and, comics in the 60s yeah, and Mom 70s Maisley, you got the you know uh and, and with that you also richard had, Pryor, I right mean. and 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 but you also had uh you know women comedians mm-hmm uh, you had, uh, you know, not to say, you know, comedy didn't have its problems back then. It certainly did. But, you know, you, 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 after a while, comedy got reduced to the, the single young white guy standing in front of a brick wall at a microphone talking to a drunken crowd about <laughs> his, his, his family and his sex life. You know, and that's what became basically 90 percent of comedy. And with it, there were no more comedy teams. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, drunken audiences have to invest in a relationship in order to be into comedy teams. So they're not going to invest. You know, the, the, the single white person is talking to the audience. Yes. The, you, you're, not, you're not listening to two people talk, which you have to invest in. You got rid of, you know, like uh, there used to have a lot of prop comedians, comedians who were, you know, comedians who specialize in different things. All that went away. All the people, you know, they just weren't making livings doing that. You had comedy all of a sudden was this is what American defined as comedy. And what had been a very big house was reduced to a, a very restricted house all of a sudden. You know, as comedy became edgier, it became actually, ironically, it became uh, much more exclusive. Yeah. And it became, a, you know, and, and, and it, it, it became less, you know, it's like we're only going after a certain audience for a certain thing and a certain... So, you know horror you know it, again it for for and that, that's reflected in the characters too you know mm -hmm. look how long it took where we said you know vampire vampire equals dracula dracula equals middle-aged white guy right you know and that's was our that that was our idea of what a vampire was you know and then as you move through, you know, you know, Dark Shadows has a tremendous impact on this, you know. Yeah, they talk about the family. The, the, yeah. the, the vampire has a family now. <laughs> you know, well, not and, and, and also he has a conscience, you know, right. which he's never had before. And, and all of a sudden it's, it liberates the character. And then Anne Rice comes along and takes that and goes in all sorts of different directions. And all of a sudden the vampire can reflect a lot of different realities, you know. And all of a sudden now you get to, you know, 70 years after the release of Lugosi's film and you say vampire, well, maybe your vampire looks like Blade. Maybe right. your vampire looks like Celine in, in, in Underworld. Maybe your vampire, you know, uh, looks uh, like the, the vampires in, in Anne Rice's interview with a vampire. Or uh, and they let the right one in most recently. Let the right one in. Let the right or... one is very important. Yeah. And, and, and you see all of a sudden diversity being reflected in the characters, not so much behind the camera, but certainly in the characters. Now we're seeing more diversity behind the camera. Those two realities meeting up can only be good. Right. And, and in times like right now, I'm expecting some, a la after a lag time of production, some super interesting art coming out so soon. 
Well, so. crisis and, and, and it usually does. <laughs> yeah. and, we're, and we're always have a crisis. The thing is we always have a crisis. You know? I, mean, I think it's already happening to some degree, but I, I expect it to just con- continue for a bit here. It's going to, well, well, it's Oh, continue. I agree. I agree. But, but I, I think, you know, that the, you're going to see this show up uh, uh, so much in the storytelling in the, and uh, in, in, it's going to be a very exciting time. But, you know, it's just like I always tell my students, you know, you think you live in interesting times, and you do. But I could put you in any position. I mean, imagine being born, you know, say, in uh, uh, 1905. Oh, God. Say you were born in 1905. You know, yeah. by the time you are 50 years old, by the time you're 50, you were going to go through two world wars, a pandemic, a depression, an, econo- an ecological disaster with the Dust Bowl and the invention of the atomic bomb and flight. Imagine what you're going to have to wrap your mind around in those 50. And that's just getting to the age of 55. I'll so say you're only a few years away from getting to the moon, too, after that. Yeah, <laughs> so, I think what the head, all right. So, you know, I said, you think you live in interesting times. Just imagine, you know, uh, going through all of those things prohibition. Uh, you know, the, uh, all the things that, that happened during those periods and I mean, all yeah. of that shows up in the storytelling, you know, always does, you know, and then in the fifties, you know, you're dealing with the red scare and an arms race and uh cold war. <laughs> you're on the verge of what rock and roll civil rights. Yeah, right. uh, and then it's all going to explode in the sixties. Yeah. yeah it's going to go crazy on you. Um, it's, it's always interesting. What I'm saying is, Everybody thinks their time is the most interesting time and the most, you know, uh, unsettling time. But it's like, that's not even close to being true. You know? Oh, no. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah. For, yes. <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that. Yes, you're right. Absolutely on. Um, a few little things that are not really big subjects, but I just wanted to make sure I mentioned before I lose you, a couple of things that I just wrote some, some things down. So you mentioned... Um, Son of Frankenstein. So Son of Frankenstein, you said, was one of the first, is that what you said? Son of Frankenstein? It was, and I, I think, if, if I'm, if I'm, I'm actually think the, the, it went like this. I think I saw uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and then right after that, um, I think I saw the original Dracula and Frankenstein. I think they both aired fairly mm-hmm. quickly on local, on area stations. So I saw both of them fairly quickly, but I think I Son of Frankenstein. I out of sequence. I, I, I probably got Bride of Frankenstein third. Gotcha. You know? So I only bring it up because I remember seeing that relatively recently, and if I remember correctly, Son of Frankenstein is the one that's highly adapted out of Young Frankenstein. If I remember yes. correctly. Yeah. If you're, and, if you're looking at what had the most, although yeah. there are bits and pieces. Yes. I mean, like the, Bride the Frankenstein. Scene obviously and, comes out of Bride and, you know, the creation sequence comes out of the original film. The little girl at the, yes. the lakeside comes out of the original film. And then some of the actual sets actually come out of the later films. So, you know, if you look at some of the, yes, the, that's right. The village sets come out of ghost uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. So there's a little bit of all of them, but yeah, uh, primarily sun is the, with the okay. way the sets are designed. And it has the inspector. the inspector too, right? In there, yeah, Kenneth yeah. Barnes playing. A- oh gosh, it's so good. <laughs> I love it so much. Well, um, because it was done with a lot of love. Because oh gosh, yes. So I, to me, to my to me, that's by far other than maybe the original producers. That's probably my favorite, Mel Brooks, just because I, I don't think anything touches. I agree with you. I think the I think the producers is his masterpiece. Yeah, those, I think it's one of the great American comedies for everybody who goes immediately to Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein. I think. Neither of those has the character depth uh, of the producers. I love, I mean, Zero Mostel is amazing, but I love uh, Gene Wilder so much in that movie. <laughs> so much. If, if, if you were to ask me to, to list my, my top 10 films, and that might change day yep. to day and mood to mood, but the producers was always going to be in my list of top 10 films of all time for me. It's for me, just personally. It's so and, and, funny. And so is the Maltese Falcon, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. We haven't even talked about that, but that, the, you know, the mystery stuff, but getting back to that for a second, the, the Maltese Falcon is just, it's perfect. You know, it's just a perfect movie. So I have a question a- from Eric Holmes to you. I, I, I would be remiss not to ask you. He wants to know from you if you know when I Am Legend might go into public domain or if it will. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> <laughs> he has dreams of making it correctly. <laughs> um, no time soon. Oh. Uh, because, you know, it's... it's uh, copyright on most things from that period are life of the author plus 40 years. So yeah. I think, you know, and Richard didn't die that long ago. He's got to wait. I'm He's so sorry. Old. Eric's going to have to be an old man, but maybe he'll have a lot more life experience to put in there by that point. Right. The primary idea of that copyright law, by the way, which is a good one was that the primary heirs could benefit off of the, of yeah. the writing that you could leave something that you can't leave property to you. If you're a writer, you don't leave property to your children, you know, but the notion of the copyright law was, you know, this would take care of the children, let the grandchildren take care of themselves. Uh, but <laughs> it's, uh, but the idea was at least for a generation past, somebody could leave something of value to their children and that they could be controlled. So the thought was life of the author plus 40 years. Um, there's that been, makes sense. Not, yeah, except Disney itself is, you know, when Mickey Mouse was about to go into the public domain, all of a sudden Congress was able to pass certain extensions on. on what are Congress. you talking about? Powerful yes. corporations having an effect over elected officials? Exactly. Uh, Mickey Mouse could get accomplished what poor struggling writers couldn't all those years. Yeah. Um, you know, so, but so the the answer is, uh, sorry, guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, You're going to have to write a version or, of it. Or you could. Just go the George Romero route and do homage. <laughs> there you go. The, 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 what, what's con considered the best adaptation of I Am Legend is not I Am Legend. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question for you too, and this is a very specific movie question because when, uh, we are gonna, uh, when we do our weekly podcast, we discuss various movies, usually somewhat newer movies, and we each bring a few to this table. But I know next week we're all going to at some point discuss the same movie. It's a rewatch for me. It's a rewatch for Greg and a first time watch, I believe for Eric. And I'm wondering if I could just get a few thoughts from you on this movie, which I assume you've seen it um, just so we could say, this is what <laughs> this person thinks about it. And that is um, rewatching. Don't look now. Nicholas rogue. Actually, it's been a long time since I've seen it. Mm-hmm. This is this is this is a film I have not revisited in a long, long time, and I'm very loath to sort of chime in. <laughs> well, basically because I have been tricked too many times by going back and seeing something, and you've done this too. I'm now. You, oh yeah. You, how many times have you said to somebody, you know, you oh you got to see this movie, and you look and you think, like, what the hell was I thinking? It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the movie I, I uh, had in my brain. Um, and there's a lot of movies that I want to go back and look at. I mean, a, a good example is um, uh, the, the, the Wages of Fear. Oh, we're... Now, I would hope... I, I, we're going to be go talking back. about that soon. Okay. Is it, is, and how much of The Sorcerer, too, because I remember being very impressed by The Sorcerer. We're doing a kind of a mini deep dive retrospective on Friedkin right now. Yes. So I want... I, my brain wants to say, you know... Now, it, I, the last time I saw The Wages of Fear, I showed it. I had a, a, a mm -hmm. friend of mine, Drew White, who was an artist in Tennessee. And I was looking, he says, we had a, before the age of VCRs, we had a classic film uh, series mm -hmm. at the local uh, art center in a small town in Tennessee. And we did a foreign film uh, series and we showed uh, The Wages of Fear. And that was like 1981. That's the last time I saw The Wages of Fear. I think it holds up pretty well. No, I'm sure it does. I'm sure. That, I'm sure. So, so does this. But I, I, I would be, you know, I'd really like a fresh look at it before I, I committed because I, I have had the rug pulled out from under me too many times. I just find it very interesting that you, they literally brought up Wages of Fear and Sorcerer because we are going to be doing Sorcerer on. So we have, a, we have a, a side podcast which is more, um, kind of doing some sort of a deep dive. So like for two or three weeks, we're doing uh, Friedkin. In fact, we're doing Friedkin's very first thing he ever made and his last feature movie. So we did uh, um, Killer Joe. And then I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's an hour long a documentary called uh, The People Versus, and I'm going to get the name wrong, Paul Crump, I believe it is. No, I, I've um, never seen it, no. And it's like, a, it's like a 60 minute documentary that never was aired on TV from like the mid 60s about a, 
uh, a, you know, a man on death row wrongly. It's pretty amazing to see something that is 60 years old and to see the exact things that are in the news right now, you know, playing out. And it's, it's, it's interesting and it's, it's saddening and maddening. Um, and just it just goes to show you. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting political there, but <laughs> no, it's all right. You know what? I mean, you you do get angry and upset when you realize you know that we are uh, redoing things and 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 we don't learn uh, as much as we should. Um, but it gets less maddening the longer view. It's again get away from the brick wall and step back. Right. And you kind of realize that one of the reasons, like a writers who write things that are eternal, that we're still doing, it's because human nature doesn't change. Right. The issues don't change. You know, what Shakespeare noticed in human nature is not like it has gone away. And it does not stop at uh, state boundaries or, or national boundaries. It, it, it extends. It's, 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 it goes right around the globe. Is that what is touches is, is universal in, in, in the human spirit, good and bad. Um, does not tend to change. And the, the activities of such a small-minded group as politicians certainly is not going to change. If you read about politicians during the Roman Empire, it sounds exactly like the politicians we know today. And it's because that species doesn't change. Their behavior doesn't change. Their tactics don't change the motives don't change and it is it, it's instructive history is incredibly instructive from that standpoint and you know the good things are there too you know and we also tend to ignore the good things we we tend to ignore the things that do unite us you know if if there's okay this is really getting off the subject <laughs> no it's not go for it but if there is you know the the, the, the one thing about social media uh that is 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 poisonous is it tends to be where people bring their hatreds their dislikes their prejudices their ignorance and they don't bring contemplation understanding empathy that you know we've got all of these wonderful things that are in our toolbox that uh you know that we've been given and then we've been given all of these you know harlan ellison said this actually who's a good friend um but you know you know harlan said you know we've been given all of these terrible things which are like rocks that we throw at each other and you know and this is you know is ignorance and hatred and prejudice and all of these terrible things and then we've been given all these other things and the you know social media is where people tend to only bring the bad stuff the knee-jerk responses tend to be ugly and nasty uh, towards each other and so it becomes very divisive and you know twitter Oh, How yeah. can you communicate anything on Twitter? Twitter is a matter of dots and dashes. It's like communicating, uh, you know, back in the day of the telegraph. You can't yeah. get any kind of substance where you could know anybody through the few characters that you can use on Twitter. And in my day, you know, when I was growing up in the 1960s, well, you know where people used to put that kind of stuff? Bumper stickers. Mm -hmm. You'd see them on the bumpers of cars. You'd go around and see people would put, you know, you know, pro Nixon or pro Hubert Humphrey bumper stickers on their cars. And that's about the same amount of weight as far as discussion and argument that Twitter has. It's the difference between like sloganeering uh, and an actual discussion. You know, it's yeah. a, that's not yeah. and, they're not and, the and, same thing. So, and all of a sudden, you know everybody. When it was a bumper sticker, you knew everything you wanted to know about the guy in that car because he's got a Humphrey sticker on his car. Mm -hmm. So he's this or he's that, and you, you don't know anything about him. You don't know the first thing about the person in that car, you know. And it was also an error which you know the worst thing you could say about somebody was not that they belonged to a different political party. There was something a little bit that we've lost. <coughs> And I'm sorry that we have lost it because, you know, it's just saying that somebody was a Democrat or a Republican wasn't a lot different from saying that they were, you know, Irish or German or whatever. It was just something that went part of their character. Oh, you know, that, that family lives down the street. You know, they're, they're Democrats or whatever. It wasn't a character 
right. judgment on them. You know, it, re- it reminds me of um, there was a, a famous uh, it was an article or a paper essay. It was all about uh, demon words or devil words and God words. And mm-hmm. if you've ever read that and where you basically will create words that are just, no matter what you attach them to, it becomes good or bad. And that they've kind of done that to those two terms. And now they are, depending on which side you're on, that's your devil word or your God word, you know, and then you're never going to, before it was like progressive and, you know, communism or before that, maybe it was you pick your, pick your, your devils and gods. Well, I, um, I, I stand with Mark Twain on this as I tend to stand with him on a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, in politics in, in, in particular, because he, he viewed politics as a form of human madness, which it is. But one of the things that, you know, Twain once said was that uh, somebody asked him about uh, his political beliefs and uh, he declared that he was a mugwomp. <laughs> well, if you don't know what a mugwomp is, you know, look it up, you know, is, 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 is again, because it's part of, of, of American history and you should know, but if you don't know, mugwomps were people who basically declared that they were after the best idea, wherever it might come from, it was the best idea. And the whole idea was that if you were sitting on a fence, you could look in two different directions at the same time and your mug might be pointed one way and your womp would be pointed in a different way, but you were a mug womp. And it was declaring allegiance to no political party. It was declaring allegiance to what was best for the nation. And, um, and that a good idea could come from a conservative and a good idea could come from somebody who termed themselves a liberal. And when, well, all of a sudden you're, you're broken into camps, you know, because I think, again, most people think that uh, political parties are written into the, the constitution. You know, everybody yeah. wants to trot those poor founding fathers out yep. every couple of hours to bolster up their arguments on something. You know, the founding fathers would have been appalled by this or they would have believed that. Right. You know, one of the things the founding fathers were pretty much in unison on was the danger of political parties. Yeah, well, they be- said, you know, that this is because they could see what had happened in other countries where political parties had had risen and they could predict what was going to happen. If that, if that became the controlling entities. And, you know, we say, you know, we, we have a, a, a bicarmel system of government. Yeah. A lot of people think that means two political parties. They think that's, that's, that's the way it is and the way it's supposed to be. And it's like, no, you know, not only that, we were warned against it. And, you know, so it is a, you know, it, it's one of those things, which is, is if you're, if you're, if you're identifying yourself through that filter, you know, and not, as Mark Twain said, you know, my idea of loyalty is loyalty to one's country, not to a political party or an office holder or an institution. Right. And I agree with that. It's um, being loyal to an institution of any sort, as opposed to the actual ideal. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, it, and, and, and I, I think there's a great sense of you. Know, Mark Twain also said at one point that, uh, um, that uh, his idea of a good politician was St. Patrick because St. Patrick had no politics, that when he came across a snake, he forgot to inquire whether the snake was a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> he just exalted his staff and let him have it. And I think that's, you know, that was right enough for him. That was, that was politics enough for him. And I think that's a, that's also great wisdom in this day and age. So, uh, you know, there's madness about there and there is, uh, and like I said, that was kind of the impetus to this in the first place was just to, once again, I think in all these times, in any time, but especially in these sorts of times, I think to turn your eyes or your ears or your brain back to the artists and the musicians and the poets, the writers, the movie makers are what we need to do. <laughs> Cause right. Because they're, that, they're not only the ones who, uh, first off, they're usually the ones who have predicted where we were going to be. Right. Who have, who, have, who have prophesied it. And then they're the ones who tend to make the most sense of it. Uh, they illuminate it for us. If nothing else, right. Right. Put it, they put it in a context or a light that lets you actually maybe recontextualize what's happening around you and hopefully um, learn to empathize. I mean, that's always the biggest thing, right? Um, 
it, it lets agree. you see things through another person's eyes or experience them through another person's eyes. I mean, just recently I got around to finally watching Moonlight, you know? Uh-huh. You know, I'm not an African-American gay man. So that's very important for me to have an experience of some sort that I might not ever have. Now, can I say that it's even close to that experience? Absolutely not. But does it give me like a, you know, scintilla of a moment of having an understanding at least possibly. And that's what hopefully good art, great art will do, you know? Well, I, you know, I, Harlan Ellison was an atheist. I just saw the documentary on him recently too. He's amazing. Dreams of Sharp Teeth is awfully good. Yes. It's a very good piece of work. Yes. I show it to my students to you know, basically uh, who want to write to uh, sort of tell them, you know, what a writer is. And Harlan yeah. used to know when I was going to show it. He always wanted to know what the students thought of it and thought of him. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, Harlan, the very first time I met him um, actually through the Twilight Zone. We met in the Twilight Zone because he was the creative consultant to the 1985 revival of the Twilight Zone on CBS. Uh-huh. And uh, I had read a fierce amount of his work at that point. And so, so when they said, do you want to interview anybody? I said, you know, can you get me Harlan Ellison? They said, yeah. You know, so we, we met and we bonded immediately. Um, he hated being called a science fiction writer. Right. Not because he wasn't proud of his science fiction, but because he thought that reduced what he did down to one of those terms again, one of those labels you know, science fiction writer Harlan Ellison. He hated, if you had said Harlan Ellison, who has written great science fiction, he'd have no problem with that. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, 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 when, we've, when we met, he said, you know, all right, kiddo, um, one, one rule. I said, yeah, I know. I can't call you a science fiction writer. He said, God bless you. <laughs> I, said, I said, you don't believe in God. He said, that's how much I mean it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know Harlan is as again as much a, as an atheist he was uh, he want, he always said to me that you know that writing is a holy chore you know now that's, a, that's quite a thing to say to you. Right. <laughs> so funny. It was, I'm a, a dear friend who's a mystery writer uh, Les Roberts who's a terrific mystery writer and uh, Les is an atheist but he believes that uh, that pets go to heaven and he believes in angels <laughs> <laughs> But see, that's the nature of belief. It, it is. doesn't it's have to follow nothing, a rule. That's there's the, nothing wrong with it. Exactly. That's the, that's the religious equivalent equivalence of not believing in political parties. Yes. And I, I, I think that's lovely. I think that's one of the loveliest things I've ever heard. Yeah. Why, do you have to, why do you have to only have one thing or the other? You can Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, you know, and, and I think that's quite a thing. It, it, it says, you know, in exactly what Harlan, you know, what you're saying about art and the, the importance of art and the illumination of art is that, you know, that Harlan could actually view it as a, as a holy chore, you know, that there was something that separated it and, yep. and made it, you know, particularly special. And, you know, I agree with my, my heroes. Of, I say this in the Twilight Zone book is, you know, that uh, Willie Nelson had a song called My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys, you know, and I said, you know, that, that, that's worked for Willie, but my heroes have always been writers. You know, and uh, you know, I uh, really discovered Mark Twain and Rod Serling in high school. I, and I knew both of them before that. And I'd been ex- exposed to both of them before that. But one of the reasons that I was drawn to them, because I thought these are incredibly heroic individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, they both were, were what Mark Twain called moralists in disguise. That's a uh, term Twain came up with when he had gotten a letter from a seven-year-old girl in France named Helene Picard and she'd sent him a, a letter and she said, you know, I, I love your writing, but I suspect that behind all of the joking, you are actually trying to teach us something that there's something very serious going on. This is a seven year old French girl. <laughs> and Twain wrote her back a letter where he basically wrote back. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody. You got it. Don't tell anybody. I'm a moralist in disguise. Now, is there a better description of Rod Serling than that? Oh, God, no. Uh, then, then, you know, somebody who was trying to hide the moral. So, you know, in high school, I kind of figured out that, you know, when, when we grew up, um, and, and certainly still to a certain extent today, uh, children, but particularly little boys, are always given heroes and role models or people who carry guns. You know, it's mm. my father's generation, it was cowboys. You know? Sure. From my generation, it tended to be detectives or 
you know, World War II dramas or things like this. Even the science fiction that was going to come along, they always had a, a version of a gun, whether it was a, ray a gun, blaster yeah. or a yeah. phaser or whatever you called it. Yep. You know, your, your ability as a hero was judged by your ability with a firearm. And, um, and in truth, a lot of people we ask to carry firearms are heroes. You know, that's not sure. denigrating anybody. We, we ask people to carry guns and we ask them to do heroic things. But what I discovered in high school, which was a corollary to that, was that you could carry ideas and be a hero. Yep. That you could carry, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that you could use words in ways which were heroic. And that's what Mark Twain and um, Rod Serling sort of uh, awoke in me. And, you know, so, you know, if going back to talking about that common theme about, you know, uh, writers, it's a, it's a very common theme. There's always a writer behind what I do. Um, you know, and I, my literary biography that, that I co-authored with Jim Tully is of a writer. You know, uh, five of the books are about Mark Twain. There's Rod Serling. I started a theater company called the Largely Literary Theater Company. And our specialty is adapting great works of literature. It started with, with Dickens, actually, and then went to Poe. Um, this runs through my entire life as I am, you know, under the spell and fascination of great writers. And, you know, and I've had the, I love it when people ask me, because I spent 43 years as a TV or film critic, and they'll say, you know, who's the favorite person you you got to meet or interview? Who's your favorite? I said, you're not going to like the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to say, you know, um, a, a, some kind of uh, famous leading man of, or, you know, some, some, sure. some star of the, uh, of the screen. And I've certainly had some, some wonderful interviews with, uh, with leading actors, in TV and, and film, but the people I've been most, thrilled to meet are the writers you know whether that that happens you know whether it is harlan ellison or or, or richard matheson um or somebody like ray bradbury or you know uh oh it just goes on and on i mean it's it, right. that's been the the great blessing of this you know and some a lot of times you got to meet people who you grew up they were your heroes and so, uh you know so yeah i think that's uh that that's a big unifying theme to to, to what I do. You know, the next book, I haven't actually shared this with anybody, but the book I'm writing right now is actually a biography of Edgar Allan Poe. Nice. So, you know, Poe is up next and there again, back to the writer, right? Absolutely. It goes back to the writer. So. I, I'm, yeah, well, we could go down a whole other rabbit hole. We should, we'll have to bring you back when you've got that to, to talk about because then we can just talk about Poe for a while. Um, so, we should probably wrap this up pretty soon because I'm taking about two hours of your life, but you've given me a lot of great information. Um, tell no a picture, but a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> hey, isn't that fitting, right? You know, it's all about words. Uh, go uh, get your own pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Go look him up. No, before we uh, part though, uh, let everybody else know once again where they can find you where they can find your works how they can get a hold of that well you know the, 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 the amazon is always a good starting place to find you know the the, the books and the, the the ones that are in print you mm -hmm. know and i'm thinking about redoing the night stalker book by the way i'm thinking about a new I, the colombo book was just done as a 30th uh anniversary uh reprint edition last year and i wrote about ten thousand new words for it and i've been stunned <clears throat> by the response to it. I've just been you know, absolutely, I thought, ah, we'll sell a few hundred copies. So no, we're doing considerably better than that. And uh, I, I, I didn't think there were that many Columbo fans left. Uh, there are. I, so yeah. It's it's because it's amazing. great. <laughs> so there's and, no reason uh, not to. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I've been, so that's got me been rethinking about a full revision on the Night Stalker book. I'm, so that, that, that may be, you know, uh, with the 50th anniversary coming up to, you know, that's, that's certainly, but um so the, the Columbo reprint is there, you know, that's, that's, that, that's kind of nice to see that one back in print and uh, the Twilight Zone book, everything I need to know I learned from the Twilight Zone. Yep. It just came out in paperback um, yep. a couple weeks ago. So the hardcover and the paperback are there. <clears throat> the Shawshank book um, and all, and I think most of the Mark Twain books are in print, you know, certainly, uh, you know, uh, the, the last three are certainly there. So 
there's a there's a there's a fair number of them in print. The Jim Tully biography is there, um, and then I have a a website just for general information. All of that links you back to, to Amazon, but uh, artfully titled MarkDewitzyak.com, so it's pretty easy to find. Um, and I found it there just I will very be. easily. So <laughs> yeah, there there I will be. <laughs> it's a pretty low tech website, but it's uh, you know, it, it all the covers are there and all of the the and again, you'll get that crazy quilt pattern of all those, of all those covers, and you can have that response that that guy going by my table had of what? Uh. <laughs> it must feel kind of pretty good though to like just pull that up and just see all those, all those staring back at you. It's what I wanted to do. I, yeah. you know, you can't complain about getting your dream. You know, my dream yeah. was to be a working writer, and to you know, and I and, and you know, my mother had a lot to do with that. Uh, my mother had a lot to do with me, uh, love of reading but also uh, a love of writers. You know, she, she made writers seem like these uh, Olympians uh, beings, you know, uh, who, who created these things called books. And I, I just, you know, I grew up thinking, boy, you know, I wonder if I'll ever see my name on the cover of a book, but that would be, that would be neat, you know? So um, it's like having a 43 year career in newspapers where you've basically been a TV and film critic all those years. Um, you don't get to complain about that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not a complaint that's going to be heard <laughs> well, and nor should it be, you know, it's, 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 it's <laughs> you know, if you're sitting in a bar, I, I mean, I, I, I use this metaphorically in the twilight zone book and say, you know, in my, when, when I had a tendency to get a little bit down about my working in newspapers and things like this, in my mind, I would go to this bar, this blue collar bar on the West side of Cleveland. And I'd be sitting in between these two hulking unemployed steel workers. And uh, we'd all be drowning our sorrows like Bogart and Casablanca. And uh, they look down at me and say like, well, what's your problem? My problem? I write about television. <laughs> That's my problem. And they look at me. Do you get paid for it? Yeah, the bastards pay me every week. The check clears too. It's a one-way invitation to the parking lot to get your ass kicked, <laughs> and you deserve it. If you're complaining about living that life, <laughs> you deserve it. So you have to have a certain appreciation of, you know, what the universe has given you, uh, and 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 what you have, and what you've been able to do. And again, it was you can't complain about getting your dream, you know. And my, my dream was um, was to be a working writer. Uh, to be one of those people who got paid for putting nouns and verbs together and uh, writing for magazines, writing plays, writing for newspapers, writing books. That's, that's what I got, you know? And uh, I, I mean, I can, I'm one of those, you're only lucky if you know you're lucky. You're only fortunate you if go. you know you're fortunate. You know, there's a lot of people who you look at their lives and you send they they like, how can you complain? Well, if you think your life is miserable, guess what? It's miserable, you know, and no amount of anybody talking to you is going to change it. If you think you're, you can be living in utter poverty and be happy. And you could say to this, like, how can you be happy? Well, you can't tell them they're unhappy. You can't. <laughs> how many people have said, how many people have you heard interviewed where they say about their childhood? Oh, you know, we grew up in a crowded apartment. You know, there were right. kind of, but we were happy. We, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor. Well, you can't go back retroactively and say, no, you were unhappy. Don't you understand? You were miserable during this time. No, they weren't. If you think you're happy, you're happy. If you think you're unhappy, you're unhappy. It's just, it's just so, it's again, it's back to the perspective thing. It's important to have a good perspective on things. It's good. It's important to have a, you know, uh, to, to say, look, you know what? Even this pandemic. Now I'm looking at, at you, Bruce. I can, I can see you. you know? mm -hmm. Yep. You are the face of somebody going through a pandemic. It's it's true. House looks relatively clean and comfortable. <laughs> yes, relatively clean. You yeah. know, I assume you're not skipping meals. Uh, I assume know. that if you open the tap, Anywhere in the house, clean water comes out. You are going through the pandemic on a luxury liner. Yeah. Compared to the way people went through pandemics historically. Or the way, to, the way a lot of people are living right now. Right. Yo, 90% of the world's 
population right. <laughs> who doesn't have clean water, who doesn't yep. have access to, to food on a regular basis. Yep. Exactly right. You are, you, you, know, you are in the top percentile as far as not only you know, history goes, but of the current world. Right. So, you know, perspective's got a lot to do with it. You know? It has everything to do with it. Perspective yeah. and context mm -hmm. means everything. And, you know, and, 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 and that's what has to change for people to sort of turn the corner on getting along because you, you, you literally have to have more perspective. I mean, one of the things about social media and, and uh, uh, the, the sort of the divisive stuff about that too is the fact that you don't actually meet people. You don't actually get to know people. Right. And I'll we'll take this down to the, the simplest of microcosm, fandom, you know. Mm -hmm. How divisive fandom has become. Right. You know, now that is very much a, 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 a acceleration point of, uh, of online gathering and social media. Sure. Because things people would have never said to each other to their face. Primarily they met at fan gatherings, conventions and such over the years. And you would get to know somebody from another state or another country even. And you would never say the things you would say knee jerk on Facebook. She's just like, well, you're an idiot for thinking that. Right. You know, you don't like what I like. You know, you know this whole you suck school of, of, of film criticism that has emerged, which is if you don't agree with me, you suck. It's right. Like, Really? <laughs> this is where, we're, where we've gotten to on this? And it's, it's, it's taken something which we all share, this love of movies or this love of television or love of entertainment, and it, it's driven people apart, you know? And that's something as benign as, 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 as movies. And it, it's, it's sad because the, it, the tool isn't the problem, but it's how it's being used. Oh, yeah. I mean, a perfect example would be like, this is Zoom. I mean, this isn't much different than a form of social media, but I mean, just this little thing, these little things I'm doing, I, I feel like every time I do one of these, to some degree, I, if, not, if I haven't made a friend, I've made a connection that I would, never would have made in my life any other way. Well, and this is about Almost conversation too. This yeah. is about, you know, uh, and, and, and it's not about, uh, you know, screaming at each other. Right. Which is what passes for political discourse. But it goes back to what you said is curiosity too. Like, mm -hmm. I'm curious to find out about this person next to me. And I'm talking to you, your author, you've written all these books and all these things. I had one of these with somebody who hadn't done any of those things. Conversation was still amazing. Different, but amazing. Because every person has something to bring to the table. And if you're having a conversation, you're finding a connection. You're finding out about a human being, you know? That's not only perspective, that goes back to curiosity too. Right. You, know, you have to be curious about people. Your, your, your view of people do not change until you know somebody who's going through something right. that you don't. You know, it is never going to change until you know somebody who would you say, well, you know, I, I don't like those, that kind of person, fill in the blank. How and do you know? That's, How do you know? Yeah. <laughs> here's the button we'll put on it. Here's the, here's the bow we'll put, put on this. And that is what art of some form can do sure. because if you can't have that conversation with Jane or Joe or Frank or whoever the you know the book the painting so on and so forth can give you a version of that so you can have a moment or two hours or a novel's worth of or a poem it's worth of um time with that person in their life having a interior conversation with their experiences and hopefully your curiosity <laughs> will pull you forward in there right i could well i couldn't agree more you yeah. know it it, it 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 is the healing hopeful thing about it and yep. that's why you know it's you you have to i think you have to be a long-term optimist you know yep. it's all right to be a short-term pessimist uh because frequently things do not work out and frequently you, there are things that have to be overcome and a lot of things you try aren't going to work out. I think that's true personally. I think it's true as society. I think it's true in, in all ways, but I think, you know, by you continually trying, you make progress. So being a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist, maybe it all works out to being a realist. Um, and isn't creativity of any sort, uh, optimistic act of some sort.
Well, sure. Too. Because any, any, why would you put it out there? Reading mm-hmm. is, is an optimist. If you, read, mm-hmm. if you open a book, it's, it's, it is an act of optimism. Right. That you're going to find something, that you're about to embark on something that you know, is going to be uh, uh, changing in, in some way in your life. So I, I, I think, yes, you, when you put your hand on the, 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 the doorknob of a, of, of a library, that's an act of, of optimism. When you do, when you reach out to, you get onto, uh, oh, call up a website uh, to look into a book or something like that. That's an act of optimism. You know, when you check out a, a movie or or a TV show for the first time, all of that is about, you know, all of a sudden maybe this is going to be. And how many times are you disappointed? Like I said, you know, you have, there, there is a short term pessimism to this, but you, eventually you are going to stumble onto that that title, that movie, that book that TV show that is going to be uh, the one in a hundred that's going to make you go, wow, I never thought that, that, that just took the top of my head right off. So change your life. Yep. Change the Absolutely. way you think. Yep. Change the way you see the world. Absolutely. Well, we should end on an optimistic note then I would say. That's a good, one. <laughs> that's that's a good, good one. place to end. Um, I would like to thank you again, Mark Dewidziak which I hopefully I'm saying correctly. You're saying it perfect, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I just like to hear you saying I'm doing it perfect. That just helps mm-hmm. me. You know. uh, thanks again for coming and talking with us and um, sharing some time with us. And it's just in time for my son to walk in so. <laughs> <laughs> and say hi. Um, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Okay. You Hope you had care. a good time. I did, Bruce. It was, this is fun. Like I said, I enjoy really well. You can tell how shy and retiring I am. <laughs> I, you, are, you really are. You're just, you're, I, a good thing I can't see you or I would have not even known you were there. So. <laughs> I am like the knight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Okay, Bruce.